Well, good evening. I wanted to thank Peter and the Friends School for inviting us here. It's such a pleasure to get to come and talk about my absolute favorite topic in the world, which is Fab Labs and education. Um, as uh, you may know, I am the. Uh, all, I have two hats in this world, at least two hats. Uh, one is as program manager at the Center for Bits and Atoms, so I have the great pleasure of working with Neil Gershenfeld, and um, also uh, as director of the uh, re relatively recently formed Fab Foundation. And so I'm going to start my story today talking just a little bit about how a cheerleader from Atlanta, Georgia, ended up helping to grow a global network of, um, of, of innovation, which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, I started out with a midlife crisis. Um, as, uh, as Peter noted, um, I was in television. I was a, a science documentary producer for public television, for NHK, for the Discovery Channel, for all sorts of, uh, all sorts of places. And um, it was a wonderful job because I got to travel all over the world and um, talk to Nobel laureates and, uh, you know, it, I got the best education that way in uh, science and technology because the experts at the time would talk to me because there were only three channels on television and, you know, there were very few of us to talk to, so they loved us, you know. but. Um, about uh, 2000, 2001, this was when the big, the, the big giant Death Star was supposed to come online with 500 channels and, and, the, and cable television was pro proliferating channels, you know, just ad nauseum. And it really put a lot of downward pressure on the idea of crafting a story and crafting a documentary. And so I got very frustrated with that. And I said, I don't, you know, I had my next four jobs lined up and I was like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. And so in frustration, one Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon, actually Sunday afternoon, I opened the Boston Globe and I was looking through the one ads just to kind of see what was out there because I was, I was curious. And there was this really strange job listing for a program manager for the Center for Bits and Atoms. I'm like, what is that? And I've got to check this out, you know. So, um, so I called uh, MIT. I made an appointment with Neil, and I met with him, and it changed my life. Everything, everything changed. I came to MIT, and of course, um, I'm still there. Uh, many years later. Um, once I got to MIT, I took this amazing course that, um, that Neil was teaching called How to Make Almost Anything, and that is actually what changed everything for me. I took the class, and uh, as he was starting to tell you, in the course of one semester, um, you learn all of these uh, tools and processes. You learn programming, you learn electronics, a little bit of everything. And the thing that's so incredible about it is that it, at the end of the semester, you have to come up with an integrated system, in essence, a, 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 some kind of project that uses all the tools or many of the tools and processes that you learned during, that, uh, during the semester. And so you pull for the knowledge you need as you need it, and you apply it right away. And I can't tell you how powerful an experience that was for me and for everybody else that was taking the course. And it was so inspiring that I did the crazy thing, um, that this I had this crazy idea that I could uh, try to run a global network of, of, of growing fab labs and go back to school. So I went back to, uh, to Harvard part-time and got my, um, uh, my master's in education and almost died in the process. It was really hard, but it really did change my life in so many ways. And, and, and the network was growing at the same time. And so we realized that we needed another organization, new kinds of organizations outside of MIT that could support uh, this amazing growing network. And so um, we formed the Fab Foundation, uh, of which I am uh, I have the great privilege of directing at this point and helping to grow. And uh, the foundation is here, as Peter said, to support the growth of this network and to give anyone, anywhere, the ability to make almost anything, to facilitate that process, and thereby, hopefully, to improve live and li lives and livelihoods around the world. And so I started to, uh, we, we started this, I make it sound a little easy. It was not easy. This is a very... Uh, global grassroots um, uh, anarchistic almost uh, uh, or a group of uh, uh, of collaborators and makers and so they don't like top down and so the first 
two or three times we tried this, we failed miserably because we tried to do it from the top down. And it's only been just recently that we've under, we, we've sort of tapped into the needs from a grassroots a grassroots perspective and are able to build a network, uh, able to build resources in essence that help the network grow uh, from the bottom up. And so what we have is about 200 or 250 fab labs around the world right now in about 30 countries. And um, uh, we're doubling in size about every 18 months. So we're experiencing our own version of Moore's Law. Um, in another year and a half, we'll easily be at 500 labs, I do believe. And what we've found is that we've accidentally or serendipitously kind of created this global infrastructure. All of these little nodes in the network share the same tools and the same processes. So it allows us to collaborate. It allows us to do business together as a, as a global community. But it, And it also serves in a way as a global classroom. And we didn't expect that. That was an unexpected application. And just, just for your information, this, this is the Barcelona Fab Lab. This is the Boston Fab Lab. That's Lima, Peru. And I think, I think that's Nairobi. I'm not sure. Um, at any rate, uh, so we're, we are really, truly all over the place. And um, uh, what we found, the, this, is, this is one of the ways where the network pulled us, uh, in, pulled us to uh, an application that was important to them. What we found is that um, there was a, a, an education disconnect in essence. So all of these learners were sort of, you know, falling off the cliff because they were bored in school or, you know, they just couldn't learn in the, in the traditional ways or whatever. And, and very special people started to, you know, sort of come to the labs to learn. So I'm going to tell you just a couple of little stories. Um, this is uh, Shipiso. Uh, she is from... Um, uh, she's from a, a township in South Africa uh, called uh, Soshengovi. And she went into the fab lab and she learned electronics and programming and all the sorts of tools and processes that we teach there. And now she, uh, it transformed her life. Now she teaches and she also works for um, uh, the CSIR in South Africa, which is just an amazing outcome for somebody in a township. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, Hans Christian. He's a, uh, he was a, a young fellow in Nor northern Norway, north of the Arctic Circle, where, um, uh, you know, the, the geographies are very challenging and, and school is, a, is, is not, a, not a great um, not a great place to learn sometimes. And so he had sort of dropped out. He was bored to death. And um, he walked into the lab one day uh, up in um, Lingen uh, when Neil was there. And Neil taught him you know, how to make some circuit boards and use, use, use the laser cutter and stuff. And, and then he kind of went away for a few weeks. And he came back. And he had made himself a full robotic sort of uh, uh, car. So it has, it, it, he had changed the way we make circuit boards and changed the designs and um, on his own pretty much come up with his own uh, with a robotic car in a period of like two weeks which was really exciting um, this is a, a young man from Russia um, Dimitri Dimitri um, and Dimitri uh, just last year we we brought a fab lab to Moscow and uh, he's 14 years old uh, he went into the fab lab and he started play he loves robotics so he started playing around with designs ended up winning the Russian um, championship and then going on to the, the European competition where I think he placed like third or fourth uh, in Europe and and then this is a very special story so this this is um, Abu or uh, Abu Bakari Adam he's from the Ghana Fab Lab so in Takarati Ghana there's a vo in essence a, a vocational school uh, that teaches sort of 16-year-old to 25-year-old people skills like um, circuitry for you know how do you how do you wire a house, um, you know uh, uh, auto mechanics, very practical uh, skills that are um, you know appreciated there. Um, he walked into the fab lab and he didn't leave for three years. Um, he then took this thing called Fab Academy, which I'm about to tell you about. Um, and um, it transformed his life. He got a scholar, full scholarship to a community college in Minnesota called Century College. And he's now taking um, engineering there. Uh, and he mentioned to me the other day, he said, gosh, you know, I said, how are you doing? How are you doing with your engineering course? And he said, well, actually, I'm a little bored. And I said, you're bored? And he says, yeah, but I, I already know all this stuff because I did Fab Academy and worked in the Fab Lab. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. 
That's a, that's a very good outcome. So these are the kinds of learners that we're attracting um, uh, uh, to the lab, and we really needed a way to, to help them and to give them more, uh, a, a, a more practical education. So now we exploited uh, this global campus, this, this global network, uh, uh, this global I'm infrastructure Gerton, in Boston, to offer uh, Fab Academy. Um, um, AS220 in Providence, who's there? Hi. So, um, Basically, what happens is once a week we gather by um, uh, video conference uh, as a community, and um, uh, we do a lecture. And then during the week, uh, uh, students work with their peers in peer groups in their in their fab in their respective fab labs, and they collaborate with some of the other expertise and other fa experts in other fab labs. And then again, we come back together during the week. And then in the course of um, uh, uh, of the semester, again, you come up with an integrated project. So um, I'm going to see if I can run this again for you. Um, so this is a. Uh, oh, that's beautiful. So this is basically musical stepping stone. a very whimsical, fun project. The second project is, a, in essence, a. a, a, a it's a cooker. I guess you call it a cooker. Basically, one source of energy produces both the um, refrigeration and uh, and the cooking um, cooking uh, capability. And then, last but not least, uh, there is a very personal project, which is the the uh, bicycle trainer. Um, so. So, so that's what we did with Fab Academy. It's been vastly successful for us. Uh, we have probably, a, we're in our like third year, we've got maybe 120, 130 students from approximately 15 or 20 countries participating, and we're growing very quickly. Um, and um, uh, it, each of those people is now becoming um, uh, part of a, a workforce uh, of people who work in fab labs and manage fab labs and teach these kinds of skills uh, in school. So um, it, it's, it's turning out to be a wonderful, uh, a wonderful way to find new opportunities in the world as well. Now, getting outside of Fab Academy, we've been, as Peter was saying, there's a real pull, a real need right now for a change, a sea change in education and how we, how we educate. And so we're really talking about nationally and internationally technical capacity building um, from the grassroots. And so um, uh, what, what, what we're doing is we're being pulled into K through 12. Uh, fab labs are getting pulled into K, K through 12 and it's, it's a little bit scary because you know we, don't, we, we wanna keep the magic of making and the excitement of what you do um, in, in this kind of environment, um, but we wanna put it in the service of, of, of STEM education, of, of improving lives and livelihoods uh, and futures. So when you think about workforce development, a lot of people are we still we're still thinking this way. You know, you had a job, you know, you had a job for thirty, you had a career for thirty years, and you incrementally built that that career, and you could expect to work in one place for 10, 20, 30 years. That's not that's no longer the case. That was the twenty the the twentieth century. Uh, the twenty first century is going to be really different. The twenty first century is a STEM capable workforce. You're going to have to be critical thinkers. You're going to have to be innovators. You could expect probably to change jobs jobs maybe every five years and um, with that you're going to have to completely change your tool set so one of the most important things you can learn is how to learn and uh, and 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 all the soft skills that we talk about collaboration teamwork communication all those sorts of things become incredibly important in this kind of a global uh, global and very competitive environment and so this is the workforce that we need to be thinking about developing and um, this is a really interesting slide. Uh, Kimberly Adams from Lockheed Martin. She's the hu she's the human resources director, and she stays up at night have, because she has nightmares about how am I going to replace my my workforce, the people that are retiring, the attrition, all the things that are happening in my workforce. I need a high highly technical uh, workforce, and I, I'm having a lot of trouble with it. So if you look at this, um, this is. Uh, the blue, the sorry, the orange line here is the job, the supply of jobs in essence uh, in, in the United States uh, over a growth period um, to, 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 to 2014. Um, the, the blue line or the gray line is actually the number of jobs that are out there. So if you so there's a little disconnect here. This this is this is the supply and this is the demand, and this gap is really about technical workforce. We can't 
train or educate people fast enough to fill that gap. And that's, um, um, as I said, that's what's keeping her up at night and, and the rest of us too, in a way. Um, now this is a different slide, uh, a different um, look at this. This is um, the number of engineering jobs is growing by about you know, 25, 30% over, uh, you know, over this uh, five, five to 10 year period. Um, however, we are only graduating, we're graduating, far, this is 350,000 uh, approximately engineering jobs, and we are graduating less, way less than 100,000, I mean, yeah, way less than 100,000 uh, engineers a year. And so that, that, that's not a very sustainable thing. And to add to this, 85% of our uh, youth are, in, are completely not interested in STEM disciplines, in, 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 in education or into, uh, into going into those disciplines. So as a um, response to this poll, we are doing something we call Fab Ed. It's a, it's a global collaboration um, to bring the magic of making a digital fabrication into formal education. It's a, a relatively new project. It's been kind of building for a while, um, but it's guided by TIES, which is the organization that um, Jan, is, uh, Jan runs, and by the Fab Foundation, and we collaborate with the global network. And so as we move into formal education, our partners are many. There's so much interest. The Minnesota schools, uh, MC2 STEM High School, uh, we have um, museums, um, ministries of education, et cetera. So collaboration is not a nat natural act, but this is my great collaborator here, Jan Morrison. And uh, she's been named as one of the top 100 women in STEM. And she's extraordinary. And um, she's going to tell you a little bit more about FabEd and STEM. <laughs> 